Good evening. I can't begin to tell you how happy I am to be here and to have you here with us, but surely uh, this is something that you can well imagine. It is always such a joy to, to me to share this message and to witness some of the fruitage that we do see. Of course, to know that more and more are making themselves aware of the nature of our work. <clears throat> I'm happy also to tell you that next month there will be an Infinite Way Study Center here in Los Angeles. And uh, all of our work will be available there, classes and uh, the writings, the tapes. There will be practitioners available. Anything, everything that will bring more of this message and its inspiration to those seeking it. <clears throat> This year has been a particularly fruitful year because of a special circumstance. In the beginning, before I had any idea of spiritual activities, religious activities, The reason that my interest reached out in this direction was that I had already become aware of what we would call the evils of this world, the poverty, the disease, man's inhumanity to man in so many different directions. and. The wonder of it all to me was that how can these things be if there is such a thing as a God? Even though I had had no religious instruction, I knew instinctively that there was a God, but I could not reconcile the fact that there is a God to these evils that we know to be on earth and especially those who travel a lot, know quite a few more. And so my religious interest wasn't in finding a religion, nor was it in finding a healing, but actually it was in finding if there were not some way in which God, whatever God may be, could really efface from the earth the errors of the human race. If we couldn't do away with mass disease and mass sin and mass wars, for those were the days when wars were beginning to threaten our generation, my early generation, This, then, brought about an interest in uh, seeking. Today, we call it uh, seeking God or the search for God. I wouldn't have known it by that name then, but that's actually what it was. And when my first spiritual experience took place, it didn't bring the answer of how God was to bring about peace on earth or harmony, but the answer came in an individual healing way. In other words, it brought healing to me, a great deal of healing, but within 48 hours, 
others were asking my help. And that is how healing work began in my personal experience. And it just kept on increasing for about 18 months until I had to leave the business world and engage only in spiritual healing. But that still did not answer that which I had been seeking, because now all that I knew was that there is healing for individuals, that God does manifest on earth, that God's grace does bring harmony into the experience of those that seek it. In other words, for those who can open their consciousness to God, God can come and bring with his presence a harmony of mind and of body and of business. In fact, during the 16 years in which I was engaged only in healing work, I witnessed healings in every department of our life, the moral, the religious, the physical, the business, the financial, and human relationships. I saw it operate in the healing of animals. I saw it operate in the gardens and in uh, animal culture. That is, I saw with herds a uh, greater milk capacity come forth through the application of what we knew of spiritual presence and power. I saw it operate in gardens to the extent that those who knew the principles and uh, availed themselves of it could have better gardens than those who depended only on human means of care. And yet, this did not bring the answer, and the answer started to come only after a good many years of this healing work, when an opportunity came to work with a board of education during an epidemic, I believe it was an epidemic of scarlet fever or measles, and the epidemic had reached such a stage that they were about to close the schools when a member of the Board of Education, who was a Unity student, asked if they could uh, first try spiritual means. And so three of us were invited to help this Unity uh, student on work regarding the epidemic, and within 24 hours it was met. The schools were not closed, and within 48 hours no more new cases were being reported. Another time I had the opportunity of working with a man in an agricultural uh, experimental farm of the state. and. An epidemic had broken out among these cows, and that epidemic was met spiritually when they could not meet it medically. Gradually, these things opened until, as most of you know, the opportunity came to work with uh, labor and management uh, affairs, strikes, and in this way, I learned that for which I was seeking in the beginning. And that is that there is a way to remove the evils from this world. And not only is it possible, but it is possible without waiting for the four billion people on earth to become metaphysicians. It is possible to do it without waiting for everybody to want spiritual help. 
In other words, it is possible and uh, it is going to happen that we are going soon to have generations born not in the carnal mind and having to work out of it, but they will be born children of God because there will be no carnal mind or mortal mind for them to be born into and later have to demonstrate their way out of. This year brought many opportunities for our groups in different parts of the world to work on these problems of the world and prove that it is true that all error, evil of any nature, is impersonal. That there are no evil persons. That all evil stems from a universal, impersonal source. Therefore, it isn't you or I who have to be reformed nor the politicians or the statesmen or the drunken drivers on the road. It isn't they who have to be reformed. It is that the ten righteous men shall save the city. That those who know the truth shall make not only themselves free, but this world free. As we go back to the ministry of Jesus Christ, and we have learned more from his ministry than from any other source, because before Jesus Christ, we only had one healer on a great national scale. And that was Gautama, the Buddha. He discovered the secret of healing, and he taught it to his disciples. And they set up these ashramas or centers where people would come to receive healing from those who had learned the secret of the uh, healing consciousness or the healing method, principle. But except for the 50 or 60 years of that ministry, we have no other great national or international or worldwide healers until we come to Christ Jesus. In fact, we don't have a large healing ministry reported anywhere in religious history until we come to Christ Jesus. And then we find, first, <clears throat> that his healing had to do with individuals. In other words, he healed many, many people of disease. In a few cases, he raised the dead. Certainly, he brought uh, a reformation or rejuvenation to some, such as the woman taken in adultery, and undoubtedly other sinners are reported to have uh, been transformed through their coming into contact with the Master. And these healings of individuals or of groups of individuals when they came together in multitudes, this is the major healing activity of the Master except that when he, healed, when he fed the multitudes, he was no longer working with individuals. He was now working with a principle by itself 
independent of individual consciousness, except his own, and through the understanding of this principle, he brought into manifestation an abundance, enough to feed everyone and to have twelve baskets full left over. Now, on another occasion, the master shows that he has discovered a principle that has nothing to do with just individual healings, but has to do with overcoming a universal error. And that is when he stills the storm. Now, this is of tremendous significance to you and to me. I can say to you that nothing is more significant than this to me because it starts me right with what I want to know. Is there a way to control the evil before it strikes the human, before it touches the human? And he proves that he can still a storm. He has found a principle that acts on weather the same as it acts on people. Think now for a minute, because this is tremendous. This proves to us, first of all, that storms have their origin in something that produces them, and that that something that produces them is subject to our control. In other words, storms are not acts of nature. Storms are not physically generated. Behind the storm, there is some vast impersonal activity cause that shows itself forth in storms. And the master had discovered what that cause of storms is. And by his understanding of the cause, he was able to remove it. Because evidently God was not the cause of storms. I know you all have insurance policies that tell you that God is responsible for all the storms. Don't believe that. That's just an alibi to save money. Or it may be the product of ignorance. It may be that a lot of people actually had no other way of uh, blaming these uh, or finding reasons for storms and naturally attributed to God. He seems to get the blame for all the good and evil in the world that we don't humanly feel we're responsible for. But the Master proved for all time that storms are not created by God because the Master came to do the will of God. And if storms had been part of the will of God, he would not have acted contrary to the will of God. He would not have stopped the storms. Just as he proved for all time that there is no law of God in a disease. Because if there were, he could not have healed one. That is really what makes the healing of disease inevitable, even though sometimes it appears difficult. But it is inevitable because there is no law of God sustaining a disease. There is no law of God causing one or perpetuating one. Therefore, no one is suffering disease because of God, not righteously nor unrighteously, and not for no reason and not because they've done evil in some way or other. In other words, God has absolutely no responsibility in human history for any disease. If he had, you can be assured Jesus Christ would not have healed disease and thereby thwarted the will of God. 
In fact, he would have had no power to do it because he acknowledged that his only power was derived from God. God would not both create a disease and a cure. It would be so simple just not to create it, and then there would be no need for the cure. Also, we read in Scripture that God is not in the whirlwind. God is not in the storm. And then again, the Master proved that God has nothing to do with storms, but he knew what had to do with storms and what to do about it. And so we find that in his uh, multiplication of the loaves and fishes, he was not treating on a personal or individual basis, but was doing something with a principle behind the scenes and instilling the storm again. He was working with a principle. And then, do you remember at the last, Peter returns to his fishing. And he isn't very successful. The master appears and tells him to drop his nets on the other side. And then there are lots of fish. And so again, we find that an infinite number of fish or an absence of fish have nothing to do with God. The lack of fish is not caused by God and neither is God sending an abundance of fish. But again, the Master has found the principle of abundance the principle of omnipresence of good where lack seems to be. Again, he is working with a principle. And so I find that not only is the spiritual ministry a possible one so that anyone and everyone should be able to be healed of their diseases and their infirmities, up to the extent, of course, of our demonstrated or attained spiritual consciousness. In other words, if we as practitioners haven't the full and complete Christ consciousness, we will not bring out the full and complete healings that are possible. In the same way, if we have some measure of understanding of the principles and some measure of attained spiritual consciousness, we will do some measure of healing work. The degree and the depth of our healing work will depend absolutely on the degree and depth of the consciousness of our practitioners and our teachers. And wherever we do not rise high enough in consciousness, we will not do the full and complete work. Uh, this is not meant to be a complete alibi for everybody who isn't healed, because in this healing activity, there is to some degree a responsibility upon the patient, at least to the degree of having within themselves some measure of conviction of spiritual grace, of spiritual power, and uh, some measure of being able to answer when the Master says, do you believe that I can do this? At least some measure of what would be called belief. But on the whole, remember, the major responsibility for healing work must rest on the practitioner and teacher because you can hardly expect our patients who are, let's say, mental cases to be able to assist in their own healing or people who are unconscious or dying, so forth and so on. So you can understand by that that it really behooves the practitioner and the teacher 
to know the letter of truth as thoroughly as possible and thereby develop the healing consciousness to a greater degree. But in addition to this individual or personal healing ministry, we come to the greater subject. And that greater subject which I've explained to you has, been, has always been my major activity in the back of my mind, the major search that we are now coming to. And I want to give you these as illustrations of uh, the fact that we are on the way toward this. A week before the Labor Day, long weekend holiday, one of our groups decided to do specific work on the subject of traffic accidents because the newspapers were calling attention to how many people would be killed and injured over this long weekend and how many had been last year and so forth. And this Infinite Way group worked on this with the result that over the long Labor Day holiday, there was not one single fatality in the city of Chicago, and there was only one fatality in the entire Cook County. Quite a record. And the fact that this is not accidental or coincidental is this that over that same long weekend, the newspapers in Canada have revealed that from the East Coast to the West Coast, the accident rate was the lowest that it's been in seven years of Labor Day holidays. And don't forget that in these seven years, the amount of automobiles on the road have increased. The traffic on the road has increased the amount of people on the highways and byways and on the streets have increased, and yet the accident rate coast to coast is lower than in seven years. Well, as a result of these two experiences, one of our groups in New Zealand undertook to do the same work for this traffic situation and the following weekend after they undertook the work, there was not one single traffic accident in the entire city. That's something of a record also. In other words, I'm trying to say to you that behind the scene, there is something operating that causes traffic accidents. And it isn't you, and it isn't the careless driver, and it isn't the drunken driver. It is something that makes an individual careless and drunken. A something that if it were not operating, there would be nobody careless, discourteous, or drunken on the road. In other words, the cause of our own carelessness, of our own disobedience to law, the cause of our disobedience to righteousness is not within ourselves. It is something operating in back of us which causes us to be as we are. It has been recognized that people themselves aren't what they seem to be, and that is why they've gone back to find out what your mother and father and grandmother and grandfather were, because uh, that's why you are this way. And, of course, your early environment gets some of the blame, too. You are let off quite lightly because most of your troubles belong to somebody else 
and they wished them on you. But the point is that somebody wished them on them too. And it wasn't a somebody. It was a something. And if you believe for a moment that is a, a gambler is a gambler because he wants to be a gambler. You don't know the nature of a gambler. If anybody in the world wants to be healed of it, he does. And so it is with those who are alcoholically inclined or drug inclined. It is not they themselves who create these conditions, nor their ancestors. And so I bring you to the basic principle that underlies all infinite way healing activity and has from its beginning. And perhaps not knowing this, you may have had difficulty in understanding what the infinite way is and how it operates. And so I will give it to you clearly now. That as far back as 1934 and 1935, I saw that it is not true that the cause of evil is in you. It does not have to be uncovered in you, and it will do you no good to try humanly to be different than you are. If you are unloving, you're going to find that humanly you have no way of making yourself loving. If you are uncharitable, there is no way you can force yourself to be charitable. If you are not of a forgiving nature, nothing is going to make you of a forgiving nature. If you are stingy, no amount of telling you that you are is going to make you liberal. You haven't the power to let loose. In other words, the fault is not yours. It lies in an impersonal source. And that was revealed to me back in 1934 and 1935, the early years of my ministry. And uh, I saw that it was a mistake to try ever to work with a human being and tell them what their error was and then ask them to try to overcome it. That they had no more power to do that than I had when I was full of errors and loads of people knew all my errors and could tell me about it. The only thing they couldn't tell me was how would I go about changing it. But with the realization of this principle that there as is an impersonal source of evil, we are able now to look away from you, look away from our patient, look away from our enemies, and realize that all evil, regardless of its name or nature, no matter what form it manifests in, all of it has its foundation in this impersonal source. Shall we name it? <clears throat> well, actually, uh, it hasn't a name of its own. It has been given names at different times by different people. In uh, the early scripture days, it was called devil or Satan. It was recognized that evil was impersonal, that it had nothing to do with you, that it was the devil or Satan tempting you. And so we have this cause then, not in you, but in devil or Satan. Had they realized the nature, oh, I am sure that those originally who named evil, devil or Satan, I'm sure they knew the cause and were able to uh, do away with it. It was only later generations that made of devil or Satan an opposite 
to God or opposition to God. Of course, the moment you do that, you've lost your power over this impersonal source of evil. The very moment that you give it the power to be the opposite of God or in opposition to God or operating against God, you have lost your power over it because you no longer know the truth. The truth is that devil or Satan, the source, the cause of all evil, is not a power, but a belief in a power that arose when men accepted two powers. In that day, when men accepted good and evil, which is usually referred to as in the Garden of Eden, the story of Adam and Eve, the moment that they accepted two powers, a good power and an evil power, in that moment they caused devil or Satan and with the belief that it was opposition to God, we have our evil perpetuated because now we went into the strangest kind of an era. We started to look for a God that would do something to the devil, that would get rid of the devil, overcome Satan. Of course, you can understand that this must have been the wrong way because we have kept on for over 7,000 years seeking to find that God that was going to destroy the devil or Satan, and we have more of the devil or Satan today than we have of God on earth. We are much more fearing evil today than we are honoring the power of God. In other words, we are not yet convinced that there is a God that can overcome this devil or Satan. Because we're not experiencing it. Look at all the troubles there are in the world that God is doing nothing about. As we come up to the beginning, this spiritual ignorance has continued for thousands of years until a century ago when at the beginning of the metaphysical era, it was again taught that this devil or Satan, or what later Paul called the carnal mind, it was discovered in the metaphysical days that this wasn't a power. Paul, you remember, made the mistake of saying that the carnal mind is enmity against God. And then Paul had a lot of trouble to prove uh, this enmity. A very hard life he had while he was traveling around introducing God to the world and uh, himself suffering every kind of an affliction that the devil could hand out. Why? Because he gave it the name carnal mind and accepted the carnal mind as enmity against God. In other words, as a power against God. That's all you have to do if you want to suffer from evil is give it a power and then look for something to overcome that power. But in these early metaphysical days, the secret was again brought to light that carnal mind is not power. Only now we find carnal mind or the devil or Satan with a new name, and the name is mortal mind. This is the name given to devil, Satan, carnal mind in our modern metaphysical age, mortal mind. It's not a bad name, mind of death, because as the source of evil, that's what it is, the mind of death. No matter where you begin, eventually you end with death. By the acceptance of this mortal mind, 
But again, you'll find that mortal mind only exists while you call it a power. So that in the earliest days of the metaphysical movement, when they were rightly declaring that mortal mind is not a power, that mortal mind is not a person, that mortal mind is not an entity, it is only a name, in those days they were able to bring through wonderful healing works. But the same mistake has been made in the metaphysical world that was made in the ancient religious world. Eventually, mortal mind, instead of representing to us a nothingness, mortal mind got to be enmity against divine mind. And so we had an immortal mind overcoming mortal mind which it can't do, for there isn't any such entity as mortal mind to be overcome. Mortal mind is only that which is really the belief in two powers. Here I found my answer in the revelation that actually we are not dealing with two powers called good and evil. We are not dealing with a god and a devil, or a god and mortal mind. We are dealing only with God as infinite, eternal, immortal, omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience, and the belief in another power. And the very moment that we are convinced that there is no power in any other power, we are back in the Garden of Eden before the apple was eaten. In the days before succumbing to the temptation of a presence or power apart from God. So that, as my own work broadened out from the personal ministry of just healing people who came who were sick or in one form of discord or another, and uh, I witnessed these experiences with epidemic and uh, with uh, corporate relationships, business activities, human relationships, it, was, it became clearer and clearer that we have the principle not only to bring harmony into the experience of those individuals who are seeking it in this age, but actually we have the principle that will end storms, that will end epidemics, prevent them ever starting. We have the principle that will make wars on earth impossible, that will forever wipe out all industrial inharmonies and discords. We have it because, as has been proven, every time a dictator has been assassinated or died, someone else has sprung up to be another one. Just as we have watched the demonstration from the earliest days, whether it was Pharaoh who was the bad dictator or Rome the bad dictator of Caesar's day or Rome of the church's day, or whether it was a political dictator of some other name or nature, we have witnessed the passing of all of these and even the destruction of their evil empires only to see them spring up again in another place. And so it is that as l if we actually believe that the death of Mr. Stalin is going to change things in Russia, we have found that it didn't. If we believe that we beat the Kaiser and therefore there's going to be no more danger to Christianity or democracy, and it didn't happen that way. And now all we have to do is remove Hitler and we'll have peace on earth and Hitler is gone and peace still is not on earth. 
So surely you know that lopping off the branches of the tree is not going to end the situation, that you will have to lay the axe at the root. We're going to have to stop being concerned about the men and women who to our sense of things are evil and get back at the root that has manifested evil through them in the same way as instead of going out and lecturing to a million people on the road over the holiday and telling them they mustn't drink before they start out and they must be courteous before they start out, all of which they have no power to do of their own accord. We have to remove from them the capacity to be evil, to be discourteous, to be careless, to be drunken. Ten righteous men can save a city. Ten righteous men. Two or more gather together in my name, and I am in the midst of them. Therefore, you can be assured of this, that the Master demonstrated for us that he could remove evil because he knew the principle. He could stop that which brought forth a storm or that which brought forth lack. And our work throughout these years now shows not only that with this principle individuals have their needs met, but now we can go further and start on a period of impersonal healing, of actually reaching the root of evil and uprooting it. And don't think that you know the root of evil if you believe that it is a power that has to be fought or overcome or that you have to destroy or rise above. No, no, no. If you are to remove the effects of error, you must understand that the root of error is not a power. It has only acted with power because it was accepted as power. But now that this claim touches your consciousness, you are there to realize the non-power, the non-law, the non-cause of that which heretofore has been called the power of evil. For there is no power of evil. There is no law of evil. There is no cause of evil. And in the degree that we realize this, in the degree that we stop fighting the devil carnal mind or mortal mind, in the degree that we can smile and say, I know thee who thou art, a belief in two powers. Ha ha! And that, and that is your finish. In that degree will you find your victories. Only you won't look upon them as victories because there was nothing to be victorious over. Except yourself and your own belief that there are two powers operating in the world. Now, place yourself in the position of one who is about to know the impersonal truth that will make us free. And let us, now it's you as an individual, each one of you is doing this with me. storm is threatened. It might be one of these modern hurricanes that now have names. Or a typhoon, tidal wave, hurricane, twister, 
any phenomena of nature. And you now are realizing that these are effects. If you like, as your eyes are closed, just look at a twister going down through a country town and ripping things to pieces. Or visualize a storm at sea of hurricane speed, intensity. Do you see that the mere fact that you can see it or visualize it, that it exists as an effect? Something has caused it. Something has brought it to experience. Therefore, it is not itself a cause. It does not have within itself a cause. It is but an effect. And what is it the effect of? Well, just think, if there were no belief in a destructive force or evil power, it wouldn't make any difference now if the storm was raging, would it? What difference does it make if we have a twister now if there is no power of destruction of evil? What difference if we have a hurricane if it has no element of evil in it? If there is no negative power, destructive power? And so you'll see then that the cause of the storm is but a belief in two powers and the very moment that you recognize that there cannot be two powers and an infinite God good, you have removed the source of that storm. Let's take the same thing with the idea of an epidemic. An epidemic has to start somehow, somewhere. Therefore, it too must be an effect of something. If there is no epidemic in this room this moment, there would be none forever, unless there was something to cause it. Something has to act as a cause to start this epidemic on its way. But tell me, if God is infinite, if God is omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, what difference does it make? There are not two powers, there is only one. And thereby you have nullified that. You have stopped the epidemic. You have stopped it from starting, or if it has started, You've stopped it in its tracks because you have removed from it its only cause, which is a universal claim or belief in two powers. That's all there is to it, a belief in two powers. The moment you can accept scripture, the moment you can accept the revelation of God, then you have nothing more to do with epidemics. You don't even care about them because their evil nature has been taken from them in the realization that there are not two powers. So, when you come to your study of the infinite way, you're going to find that there is a stumbling block or a barrier. And I want to give that to you tonight so that you can eliminate it from your experience as rapidly as possible. That barrier is an ignorance of what we mean by God, an understanding of the nature of God. That is the barrier. That also was revealed to me as the barrier in my own life back in 1934 and 5. The barrier once removed that changed the whole nature of my life and of the infinite way. Everyone has some concept of God, and it's an erroneous concept. 
There isn't anybody with a correct concept of God. Everybody has an erroneous concept of God. And there are no exceptions to that rule. Anyone who thinks they know and understand God have a long, long way to travel because the beginning of your spiritual freedom can only begin, can only start to emerge when you acknowledge that you do not yet know the nature of God. To know God aright is life eternal. And so if you haven't demonstrated that you can be alive as long as you want to be alive and in full use of all your faculties and health, you have not yet demonstrated the nature, the understanding of the nature of God, and you have a long way to go. We all have a distance to go, only some of us have caught a little glimpse that gives us a grain, and probably that's as much as we will absorb in this lifetime, a grain or two, but we can begin with that grain or two. When you read, then, the word God, in the infinite way writings, do not think for a moment that I mean by that what you think or what you conceive God to be. The word is spelled the same, G-O-D, but we have different meanings. And the same with prayer. When you read the word prayer in the infinite way writings, look in the largest dictionary you can find. Read every one of the meanings that it has there. And then remember that I don't mean any one of those. And then you'll see what I mean. When I say that prayer is our contact with God, but not any form of prayer that we've heretofore known. We have to go higher in our understanding of prayer the same as we have to go higher in the understanding of the nature of God, the meaning of God. God is beyond the ability of any one of us to know intellectually. None of us with the mind will ever know God. Only as we transcend the activity of mind can God reveal himself or itself to us in an actual experience. You don't experience God through the mind. You experience God when you have transcended all activity of the mind. And yet you use the mind to reach that point of beyond mind. And you use the mind in this way. Since we cannot know God with our mind, let us see if we cannot know the nature of God. Because even attaining an awareness of the nature of God, we will transcend the activity of the mind whereby God can actually reveal itself to us in an experience. As we come to this place of understanding God, we understand prayer. As we come to understand prayer and come into communion with God, we watch this full and complete revelation of non-power. That is what we are going to go into in a very few minutes. I'll answer this question. Do you feel that in a desperate human situation, such as danger, that intercessory prayer is ever effective? Intercessory prayer, if that means turning to another individual, is always effective if the individual to whom we turn has attained spiritual consciousness. And that is where you are going to see that Above and beyond the knowledge of truth, there must be the experience that bestows on us this 
spiritual capacity. You must remember that the Master made it clear he could heal the sick only for one reason. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And so you will see that our entire work, and you'll understand these passages better now in the writings, our entire work is merely using the letter of truth so that we can rise above it into that place where the Spirit of the Lord God is upon us, where we enter the fourth dimensional consciousness which does the healing works. Now we're going to have a few moments of relaxation. Now let us see how we can bring ourselves into an attitude of prayer or an altitude of prayer whereby we will be able to bring the Spirit of God upon us so that that Spirit may work in us and through us for its purposes, for its glory. And you remember that by the ministry of the Master, we know that its will is only good. Remember, the will of the Father is that we be well, completely whole. That is why the Master healed all manner of diseases so that he might prove to us that the will of God is that we be whole, complete. And he demonstrated supply in order to prove that it is God's will that we have abundance, sufficient for our needs always, and twelve baskets full left over. That it is God's will that storms do not destroy us or any other form of evil. But that we may experience God's grace is evident that there is something for us to do because without doing it we are not receiving God's grace. If again you study the Master, you will see what an important word is the word you or ye. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Ye shall pray for your enemies. Ye shall forgive those that persecute you. Ye shall forgive seventy times seven those that offend thee. Ye shall do this, ye shall not do that. Every word of the Master's teaching is aimed at you or ye. Every word of it is something that we must do or something that we are doing that we must not do. So it is that whatever of God's grace is to be brought into our experience must be brought by an activity of our own consciousness. Now you may accept that as a definite principle, and you will never find it violated, that whatever good is to be, spiritual good, is to be brought into our experience must be brought by some activity of our own consciousness. In other words, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Ye must do something. You must pray without ceasing, Paul says. We must do all of these things if we are to bring this harmony, this grace, into our experience. And now let us do something. Let us close our eyes for a moment and uh, let us think about the sun setting this evening. And uh, let us realize it has already happened. We didn't pray that it should happen. We didn't know the truth that it should happen. We didn't give the sun a treatment that it should set, nor did we appeal to God. 
Up until this moment, we probably didn't even think about the sun setting on time, yet it did. Now we're going to think about the sun rising tomorrow morning, but also we're going to think how futile it would be for us to try, through any means we know, prayer or treatment, mental or physical power, to make the sun rise one single second before its ordained time. Think as you sit here now. See, if you like, in your mind's eye, the sun rising, and see that all that you can do is be a beholder of God in action, the law in action, nature in action, whatever name you wish, as long as you see that you can only be a beholder of the sun setting, the sun rising, but that you yourself cannot influence those things, nor can you by any known means bring the power of God to set the sun or rise the sun, or delay it or hasten it. I can of my own self do nothing but bear witness to God in action. Now let us hasten out to the beach and notice the tide either going out or coming in. And let us again note there's really nothing I can do to hasten its going out or its coming in or to delay these. I have absolutely no influence over those tides nor have I any influence with God that would cause God for any reason to change the incoming and outgoing tides. Therefore, I can stand at this beach and behold the law at work that brings the tides in and out at their appointed times. Now let us take a stroll out into your garden or over into the park and let us notice the trees in bloom, the flowers blooming, the buds not yet opened, and see how helpless you are to change anything within range of your eyes in this garden. You can neither open the buds nor close them. You can neither hasten their opening nor delay their opening. Nor can you make thistles grow on fig trees or apples on rose bushes. You can be still and know that I, the presence of God within you, is the only power. Be still and know that I, the Spirit of God alone, governs his universe. We are witnesses to God's government of the sun, moon, and stars. We are witnesses to the movement of the tides by whatever law of nature may be operating. We are witnesses to the fact that there is a law of like begetting like. Roses must come from rose bushes, apples from apple trees. There is a law and we are witnesses to the operation of that law, to the activity of the law and we are witnesses to the fruitage. Just think, there are nuts on the nut trees, fruit on the fruit trees, flowers on the flower bushes, like begetting like, a law in operation. 
effect. We have no power to change any of this scene. And we have no influence with God that would cause God to do differently than God is doing. Let us look down into the ground. Note in some places the huge deposits of coal, iron, copper, gold, silver, diamonds. And let us remember not only that we had nothing to do with their being there, we had no government or control or influence over God that would cause God to produce them or to withhold them. Please notice all of this wealth in the ground. And notice that we are witnesses to the fact that it is there. And many more things are in the ground that we have not yet discovered or discovered a use for. Let us look down into the ocean. We know by recent discoveries how many things there are in the ocean for which we have not yet found the purpose or use or utilization. We know of the beds of pearls down there and how many other forms of wealth. And above all things, we know that we are not responsible for them being there. Neither you nor I, nor our parents, nor grandparents, nor ancestors had anything to do with that which is in the ground and that which is in the sea, but all of us are witnesses to the fact that God's grace has filled this earth and the seas and the air above the earth and the heavens and the planets we are witnesses to law in action. We are witnesses to God in action, to a creative, intelligent force, power, authority. We are witnesses to a divine nature operating universally, impersonally, impartially. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now in your mind's eye, just glance around, sun, moon, stars, tides, what is in the ground and in the sea, what is in the air above and what is in the heavens above, and acknowledge that you are a witness to God's glory, that you can acknowledge that God made the heavens and the earth and the waters, that there is a divine principle, law, soul, intelligence, operating in this universe and that man is not responsible for any of it nor has man any influence upon the God that is responsible. I am emphasizing this point. You know full well that you have had no influence on the fullness of the earth and all that there is therein you know that you have had no responsibility for the laws operating in our universe. That is clear to you. You can quickly say with the Master, I can of my own self do nothing. I can only bear witness to what the Father is doing and has done and is forever doing. For God is the same yesterday and today and forever. That which God is doing, God has always been doing. 
that which God has always been doing, God will always be doing. For God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All of these phenomena of nature, which we have just talked about, remember, this has been going on since the beginning of time. It will go on unto the end of time. For I, the Spirit of God within you, will never leave thee nor forsake thee. As I was with Abraham, so I am with you. The Spirit of God that has been the activity and the law, the creative principle of this universe, does not stop. It is from everlasting unto everlasting, and we will always be able to say with the Master, I can of my own self do nothing. I bear witness that the Father within me doeth the works, that the Father within me is the creative principle of this universe and of all that is therein and of all the laws that govern the universe. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keepeth the watch, the watchman waketh but in vain. I can of my own self do nothing, not build houses and not be a good watchman, except the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, except the Lord work in me and through me, I can of my own self do nothing. I bear witness that there is a presence and a power and that it is responsible for the creating, maintaining, and sustaining of the universe. And I am a witness to its activity. And now I emphasize again. We have no influence upon that creative principle. We cannot make it do anything or cause it to stop doing something. Therefore, in this very moment of our meditation, let us humbly acknowledge that we have no influence over God. Now this will be one of the most important moments of your entire life because it is going to change your whole concept of prayer and enable you to pray righteous prayer, the efficacious prayer, Prayer is our means of contact with God, but think now on what is being revealed to us in this moment. We have no influence upon God. We cannot cause God to do something, nor can we stop God from doing anything that is going on. And in this very moment, you, of your own accord, can see why it is folly to reach out to God, to have God do something for you, or for your patients, or for your students, or for your family. You can see now that you can rest and take no thought for your life what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or what you shall put on. You shall take no thought for your life whatsoever. Why? Your Heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. Does this not change your prayer immediately? Your Father knoweth. Do not try anymore to tell God. Do not try to enlighten God, and above all, do not try to influence God, for you cannot influence God on your behalf or your families or your patients or your students. And then what is your prayer? 
your prayer is that of an attitude and an altitude. Be a beholder. Be a witness of God at work. Now, if there is someone to whom you wish to bring healing, yourself or another, remain as you are, eyes closed, in an attitude of seeing, witnessing God at work, just as you will look into your garden and watch the buds open into flowers, or as you will watch the buds on fruit trees turn into or become fruit, knowing that you have no power to make it so or hasten it so, that you only have the power to be still and bear witness that it is happening. And so in your mind's eye now, remember, you are not appealing to God to heal anyone. You are not turning to God to be healed or to heal. You are now witnessing God at work. The presence of the Father within, the invisible presence which appears outwardly as the harmony. We call it healing, but it isn't. It is the coming into visible sight of the invisible harmony that is always there, but now it is coming into visibility because of our knowing the truth, not because of any influence that we have on God or with God. For be assured we haven't. God is no respecter of persons, not of any persons. But we are beholders. And we acknowledge that except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except God maintain the harmony and the peace, the health, the wholeness, the completeness, it would be folly for us to try to bring it about. Now, once you have come to this place, where you can sit, let us say, with some person's sickness in your mind, and say to yourself, I no longer reach out to God for help. I no longer try to influence God on anyone's behalf. But I do know this, that because of omnipresence, because God is, everywhere equally present that the activity of God is now taking place. It is not to be sought, not to be pleaded for, not to be affirmed into existence. It is now. Omnipresence itself. Here present where I am. There present where you are. They are present where he is, she is, it is, omnipresence itself, and I acknowledge this, and I am now a beholder of the invisible, the divine, manifesting outwardly as a perfect creation. And because I have seen that there are not two powers. Don't forget this. There are not two powers. There is no power of sin or disease. No power of nature operating to withhold God and the fruits of God. There is no evil power in all of this universe there are not two powers. 
And we have been in sin and disease and in death because of the acceptance of the universal belief in two powers. But here and now I know that God is omnipotent, and this means the all or only power. And besides God, besides the power of this invisible spirit, there is no other power. There is no power in the whirlwind. God is not in the whirlwind or the storm. God is not in the sin and God is not in the disease and there is no other power. The only carnal mind there is is the belief that there are two powers and the only place that you can overcome the carnal mind is in your own consciousness. And you don't overcome it as if the carnal mind or mortal mind were some enemy enemy or enmity that you had to fight. The carnal mind is just a universal belief in two powers that you no longer believe in. The reason you no longer believe in it is you no longer have the same concept of God that you formerly had, something to which you pray to overcome something. You've lost that concept of God, and now what you understand of the nature of God is this, that God is not to be appealed to. God is not to be influenced. God is not to be asked to do something. God is to be understood as the very spiritual, incorporeal, omnipotent presence that is here and now, and besides which, there is nothing else. Ye shall know the truth. Take no thought for your life, but rest in the truth that your heavenly Father, the divine intelligence that is closer to you than breathing, knoweth your need. And because its nature is divine love, it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom as you be still and know that I, the presence of God in the midst of you, is the only power and we are bearing witness to this truth. We are sitting absolutely relaxed from any desire to seek a God power. We are relaxed from any effort to inform God or influence God or send someone, send God to someone we know. We are satisfied to sit here in the silence and witness God at work, acknowledge God in all our ways. Acknowledge God that now, acknowledge that God now fills the earth and the heavens and all the places beneath the earth that God operates are, here we come to the word, here it is. Roses come from rose bushes because of a grace in operation. It is the grace of God, the will of God or law of God, that rose bushes bear roses, apple trees bear trees. Now we have it. This earth, and everyone in it and on it and on the, all the other planets as well is governed by a grace of God which means the will of God the power of God the will of God and the power of God is expressed through his grace not by might not by power not by trying to use a mental might, not by trying to find some spiritual power, not by might, not by power, but by God's grace. God's grace formed 
all that exists. Creation is not in the seed of a child because the seed had to have a creator and the seed had to be given its properties. A rose seed had to be given the properties of a rose and the seed of a child had to be given the properties of the child. The fertilizing seed had to be given the powers of fertilization. All of this comes as the result of an invisible law at work. A law that we do not influence, a law that we do not control, but a law to which we can bear witness. We can sit here in the silence and think of that law that is operating, that results in the seed, in the male and in the female, in the animals and the plants. And just think, there is something operating invisibly to place these seeds where they are. All of the visible is made of the substance of something invisible and of an invisible activity. Now the activity that results in sin and disease and in storms, this activity is a universal belief in two powers operating hypnotically in consciousness. Every negative experience is the result of a universal belief in two powers, but since one with God is a majority, the one we call the practitioner is the authority through knowing the truth that prevents the operation of this carnal mind by knowing the truth that there is no power in the carnal mind for well, the carnal mind is but a belief in two powers. And this belief, in your case and mine, is now without a believer. Here we are, two or more gathered together in the realization that I, God, in the midst of me, is the all power and the only power. I, God, in the midst of everyone on the face of the globe. And those who have been here before, and those who are yet to come. I, God, in the midst of them, is the only power. And this universal belief in a power apart from God now dies. It dies in my consciousness and yours as we acknowledge the invisible as omnipotence. Be still and know that I, in the midst of you, the indwelling Father, or Christ, is the infinite all power, and there is no other power. Therefore, there is no power of evil, no power of sin, no power of disease, because there is no power in the carnal mind the belief in two powers. Now you are bearing witness to truth. You are bearing witness. You're not causing anything. You're not using any powers. You are bearing witness to the truth that I, in the midst of you, the still small voice, the presence of God or Christ, in the midst of you is the only power functioning in heaven and earth and all places in between. And that we know now that devil, Satan, carnal mind, mortal mind is but a universal belief in two powers without any foundation or law. And in this we are bearing witness to the truth that makes us free. 
in this we are giving the treatment that results in freedom. In this we are praying without ceasing. There is no prayer in going to God for anything. There is no prayer in trying to influence God on someone's behalf. There is no prayer using spiritual power. The only prayer is bearing witness to truth, communing within in the realization that the Father within me, he doeth the works. It is his good pleasure to give us harmony and peace on earth. Not merely you or me or your family or mine. God is no respecter of persons. Whatever is true is universally true, and therefore I am only bearing witness when I know that God constitutes the life, mind, soul, spirit, and being of every individual on earth. And besides God, there are no others on earth. And this that has been causing earth's troubles is the universally accepted Adamic belief that there are two powers. In our renouncing of two powers, in our acknowledging that there is only one power and I in the midst of me am that power, I am bearing witness to truth and I am praying in the highest attitude and highest altitude of prayer. In other words, it is as much as if I were relaxing and saying, thank God there is a God. I need only rest. Rest in his word. Out here is only temporal power or a belief in two powers. And then rest in that word. And then watch as harmony begins to appear. It is almost as if you were looking over your own shoulder and watching harmony as it comes into your experience. Not by anything you've done, not by any favor that God is doing you, but because you are living, moving, and having your being as a witness to God in action. As you are a witness to truth. Not a manipulator of truth. Not a wielder of truth. You can't use truth, but you can watch how truth can use you. You can watch how truth can manifest itself in our experience as we more and more become witnesses. Now that's what we are. And that's what we have been told in Scripture, that we are to bear witness we are to be witnesses of God in action. We are not to whip God into action. Not by prayers, not by treatments, not by any belief that we have greater wisdom than God's and can tell God or that we have more love than God has and we can make God more loving. Let us acknowledge here and now that any belief we have ever entertained that we can bring God to do something in us or through us or for us or for anyone else has a, been a misconception of God. Let us acknowledge that God is, that God is infinite, omnipresence, omnipotence. Let us acknowledge that God is no respecter of persons. There's neither Jew nor Greek in the sight of God. There's neither bond nor free in the sight of God. There's not even saint or sinner in the sight of God. And we only fall out of attunement with God because we have accepted two powers, an evil power which we fear. You have witnessed in these past weeks the fear that is being generated in this world. How can anyone generate fear in themselves or in another if they actually understand God as infinite? Tell me how you can ever generate fear 
if you believe in God. How can you generate fear in yourself or how can you permit anyone else to generate a fear in you? If you have caught the slightest glimpse of what brought the infinite way into being, and what brought it into being, this very thing that I am telling you tonight, that there is a way to remove every evil from the face of the globe, and we have that way. You have it, I have it, and anyone else has it who can grasp this truth of the omnipresence of God within you, wherever you are, whoever you are, and the fact that God is omnipotence. Beside God there is no other, and that the only evil there ever has been in the world has come forth from accepting a power apart from God and then fearing what it can do to you. But Scripture says, fear not what mortal man can do to you. Fear not. Fear not what temporal powers can do to you. Why? God is the all power and the only power. You as an individual can prove this starting with any minor healings that may be necessary in your family circle by holding fast to the truth that the only power is the kingdom of God that's within me and that this that is claiming power is only an effect, a product of a universal belief in two powers. Then you'll see that as you bring out little healings here and there, minor ones, that it only is necessary to keep at it until you are bringing out major ones, and by then you will see what we are attempting in this infinite way work, and that is removing the source of evil. And the source of evil in the world isn't a man or woman or groups of men or women. The source of evil is a universal belief in two powers that really acts hypnotically upon us, mesmerically. But the moment that we begin to realize omnipotence and omnipresence and omniscience, that your Heavenly Father knoweth, you have need of these things. Don't try to force them to give it to you. Don't try to influence them in anyone's behalf. Sit quietly and bear witness. Bear witness. If we have uh, an air cooling apparatus in this room, the switch is on, we merely bear witness to it in operation. We don't sit around trying to make it operate, and uh, we don't pray about its operation. We just bear witness and enjoy it. There is a principle of life that governs electricity and electronics. There is, there is a presence and power in the world that governs the consciousness of mankind, even as we have proven in these experiments with traffic with strikes, with labor. There is a divine power, influence, activity that operates in men's consciousness the moment one or more knows the truth. The truth that there is but one power and that it is only the acceptance of a belief in two powers that has caused our trouble. And the moment we withdraw from the belief in two powers, and acknowledge, except the Lord build a house, there's going to be no house. Thou, Pilate, by any name or nature, can have no power over me or this world, except that we're given thee of God. And then you see, the whole nature of Pilate has to change. So it is, as you work with human relationships, and you will find this especially helpful in uh, the book Practicing the Presence, there is a chapter, Love Thy Neighbor, and in The Art of Spiritual Healing, there is a chapter, Relationship of Oneness. 
when you catch the principle that is in those two chapters and come to the realization of that truth, you will soon see how other people's nature will change toward you. Now, you're not going to reach out and try to make them any different than they are. You are going to know the truth within yourself that there is but one self and that there is no presence or power in any other self and therefore that self is my self and your self and his self and her self and there is only one self in the whole family of men and then as you see how their attitude changes towards you you will see why we have been fruitful in our larger corporate work because without anyone knowing what has been taking place, their nature has changed. Their will has changed. Their purpose has changed. Nobody gave them a treatment. Oh, don't think anybody in our work would sit around giving anyone a treatment or try to stop them being bad if they want to be. Our treatments are self-treatments. I treat myself in this manner that I know that God constitutes my selfhood. But, unless I were very egotistic, I would have to acknowledge that if God constitutes my selfhood, God constitutes your selfhood. And the moment I've acknowledged that, I'm loving my neighbor as myself. I'm declaring that you, my neighbor, have the same selfhood I have. God is that selfhood. And the moment I acknowledge that God is your selfhood, your whole attitude changes. You become much more godly, or son of godly, or daughter of godly. The moment someone stops malpracticing you, judging you, condemning you, lifts the guilt off of your shoulders and acknowledges why the same God that constitutes my being constitutes your being, you'll find you are released. And all of a sudden you're acting like the child of God as you were meant to. So it is. We are not asking God to change this universe. And we're not asking God to change you or our enemies. We are turning within ourselves to acknowledge that if the Lord built the house, the Lord built your house and mine. If your mind and body and being is the temple of God, God built that temple. Therefore, God is your temple as well as my temple. God is your selfhood and my selfhood. Now you see there is no malpractice going on. Therefore, there is no response to malpractice. You know, there is a belief that one person can malpractice another person. The only form of malpractice there is is self-malpractice. Every time you actually think that another person is good or evil, you're malpracticing, and that malpractice must come back upon yourself because there is but one self. When you realize the spiritual nature of individual identity, you have stopped self-malpractice, and you now are loving your neighbor as yourself. There is only one way spiritually to love our neighbor as ourself, and that is to know that our neighbor is ourself and that our self is our neighbor, because God is my self. Therefore, God is your self. And the moment I can see you in that light, you and I are more than neighbors. We are friends. We're more than friends. We're brothers and sisters. And we're even more than brothers and sisters. We're the one self, just made manifest in different forms. Now, do you see how all of this takes place without any going to God to have God change me or have God change you? Health is restored in the same way. Release God from any responsibility for your health. 
release God from any responsibility for doing anything for you and just acknowledge that God has been doing God's work since the beginning of time and God can be trusted to keep on doing God's work till the end of time. Just let God do it and you become a beholder. You become a witness of God in action. And so if you're sitting at the bedside of someone who is sick, don't be there as a doer, an actor, a beer. Sit there as a beholder, a witness. And bear witness as harmony is restored by the grace of the God that you are acknowledging. By the grace of the God, not the grace of God that you're bringing into the experience. You won't be able afterward to go out and say, look what a wonderful healer I am, or what a great understanding I have. You will only be able to say, oh, how wonderful that I've learned to be a witness to God in action, to bear witness to truth. Then you'll know why the master was not indulging in any mock humility when he said, I can of my own self do nothing. He wasn't trying to be modest. He was telling us the truth. I can of my own self do nothing. It is the Father within me that doeth the works, the Father that knoweth in advance what things ye have need of, the Father whose good pleasure it is to give you the kingdom, and the Father who has no devil or Satan to oppose his will and his way, because there is no God but God, no power but the power of God, no law but spiritual law. And all you're doing is bearing witness to that. You're not making it happen. You're bearing witness to it. And then, when healings take place, for the first time you'll know the real meaning of humility. Once you witness an actual healing, you will know for all time the true meaning of humility because it will strike you clearly that you had nothing whatsoever to do with it. You were just the silent witness to the operation of truth. You were the silent witness to the truth that there is no power but God, that you need not fear the power of sin or the power of disease or the power of death or the power of tyrants. You need not fear temporal power after you've once witnessed a healing because you will know how foolish ever to fear what mortal man can do, what mortal mind can do, what mortal anything can do. Once you have borne witness to the truth, there is but one power. And always remember, you don't contact this power somewhere. This is the power that is incorporated in your own being. The power which, after you've gone far enough with prayer, you'll be able to say as the Master did, I am that power. I am the truth. I am life eternal. I am the divine. But until you reach there, at least acknowledge that this power, presence, and divinity is within you, closer to you than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, and that it has no opposition, no opposite, no devil to fight, no Satan to fight, no mortal mind to fight, no carnal mind to fight, because beside me, the I within, there is no power. Beside me, Isaiah says, there are no God. Beside me, the power in me, there are no evil powers. No evil presence. I and my Father are one, and in that oneness is the all power in heaven and on earth and everywhere else. I and my Father are one, and in that oneness I am the spiritual law. I am the spiritual life. I, the Father within me, is the spiritual life, the spiritual law. And I don't exercise power. I don't use power, and I don't send spiritual power out to anyone. I only acknowledge that God in the midst of you is already the power. It doesn't have to be sent there. I merely bear witness 
that it is there. And those of you who haven't known this, all of a sudden discover that there are harmonious effects in your own experience. But remember, the harmonious effects couldn't come if the harmonious cause wasn't right there within you. We as practitioners do not ex exercise power over you, nor do we exercise power with God, nor do we have power with God or influence God. Our function as a practitioner is to bear witness to this truth. The kingdom of God is within you. It knoweth your need before you do. Because it is divine love, it is its pleasure to supply you. And above all, thank God there are not two powers in the world. There are no powers opposed to God. There are no laws opposed to spiritual law. And only the universally held belief in two powers has caused our trouble. Now I, as one, am a majority in my realization of God as the one and only power. And as I bear witness to that, those who turn to me for help find it. You become this same law in any moment that you wish any moment that you can perceive that the kingdom of God is closer to you than breathing, the whole kingdom of God, of power, is within you. And you don't have to use it. You just bear witness to its being there. You'll find yourself doing the same work because it's all in acknowledgement. Acknowledge him in all thy ways. Lean not unto your own understanding except the Lord build a house. You bear witness to the infinite power that is within you and then realize that there are no other powers. You have nothing to fear, no pilots, no storms, no temporal powers. You have nothing to fear because there are not two powers. You are restored to Eden the Garden of Eden before the fall, in the moment that you become that pure, that you no longer behold iniquity. When you no longer believe that there are powers of evil, you are restored to the Father's house. You are robed and jeweled as an heir, joint heir of God. In that moment, when you can acknowledge my function isn't to use God. My function isn't to get the power of God. My function is to bear witness. Still small voice is within me. The presence and the power of God is within me. I don't have to beg, plead, or affirm. I have to know the kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there. It is not in holy mountains or temples in Jerusalem. The kingdom of God, power of life, of love, of rehabilitation, the power of transformation, the power of the renewing is within me, within you. It is a universal, impersonal presence, impartial, spiritual, and because its nature is omniscience, it knows our need. And because its nature is love, it is its good pleasure to fulfill itself in us. Not for my glory or yours, for its glory. The heavens show forth the glory of God. The firmament showeth forth his handiwork. And more than heaven and earth, I am to show forth God's glory by letting his glory flow through me. I can do all things through Christ. I live, yet not I. Christ liveth my life. I bear witness to the fact that there is a divinity within me that is living my life and going before me to make the crooked places straight, going before me to establish me and my work. I bear witness to this. I don't make it happen. 
And I also bear witness to the fact that there are no carnal powers to obstruct or interfere, for there are no powers but God. And then I have to act that way. When the threat of a temporal power reaches my awareness, it is up to me then to be still and know. To be still and know. Bear witness. Remember Daniel in the lion's den doing nothing. His back turned to the danger because he didn't fear it. And being there mute and still. And what happens? The lions never open their mouths. Why? He, Daniel, was bearing witness to the fact that the same God that was his life was the life of the lions. The same presence within him was the presence within the lions. For we are one, not two. Love thy neighbor as thyself, even the animal neighbors vegetable and mineral neighbors to understand that we all share the same life. Bear witness to God in action. And give up the attempt to use. Give up the attempt to influence. Give up the attempt to change God or yourself. And just live the life of a witness. Thank you.